Hello, hello, everyone. Oh. Where's, where's this gone? <laughs> where, where the, where's the images gone? Uh, give me one sec. Hello, Scrat. Hello, Alfie in the chat as well. Interesting, interesting. There we go. <laughs> hello, Dr. Grass in the chat as well. The Chinese Grand Prix. Lando was lightning. Alonso enlightened. Lance Stroll caused chaos this weekend in China. So I asked you for your hottest takes from the 2024 Chinese Grand Prix. Let's get into them. Should we have a little chat about the Chinese Grand Prix and how mixed? Let's say, let's use the word mixed. It was overall. I think. There were some ups, there were some downs. Obviously, the first sprint weekend of the season as well. So we can have a little chat about it being a sprint weekend, how the sprint format differed and whether or not we enjoyed it. But in case you missed it, here was the standings after the Chinese Grand Prix. Max Verstappen came out victorious. Lando Norris and Sergio Perez on the podium. The two Ferraris behind him, fourth and fifth. Charles Leclerc just ahead of Carlos Sainz. George Russell in 6th place, Fernando Alonso with a run to 7th place and the bonus point as well for Fernando Alonso, fastest lap. Oscar Piastri in 8th, Lewis Hamilton 9th and Nico Hülkenberg rounding out the points. Ocon, Albon, Gasly, Stroll, Sun uh, Joe and Magnussen and Sargent finish the race outside of the points. And then there was Daniel Ricciardo, Yuki Tsunoda and Valtteri Bottas retired from the Grand Prix. Did I sleep in today? I didn't know. I was live. I was live, but uh, just had some technical difficulties. But we're here. We're ready and raring to go. Hello, Kiefer in the chat too. Let's talk about your hot takes then and delve into them. First and foremost, a hot take from myself because nobody was mentioning Lando Norris in the comments of the hot takes. Remember, if you want to get your hot take in, you have to head over to the community tab after the race and I... Have a post on there where you can submit your hot takes but i thought i'd throw in one of mine lando norris has still got it okay he threw away the sprint race he definitely redeemed himself in the full grand prix and a sublime drive i would say from lando norris like okay the sprint race was very very frustrating obviously started on pole position in the sprint race so should have gone on to do a little bit better than 7th and just picking up a couple of points. But put that to one side, came out in qualifying, made sure that he delivered, put himself in and amongst the pack once again. And then come the actual race itself, put in a stunning performance, really held on to those tyres well. And just showing that maybe for the first time this season, that McLaren can actually live up to the expectation. A lot of people coming into this season thinking Lando Norris is going to be second place to Max Verstappen a lot of the time. Maybe he can actually battle with Max Verstappen for victories here and there throughout the season. But hasn't quite been the case over the first four Grand Prix. This Grand Prix seemed like a little bit of a click moment for Lando Norris and he stepped up in terms of that performance this weekend. Obviously, Oscar Piastri's damage slightly inflated the gap between the two. But I do think Lando Norris has finally found a way to get the best out of this McLaren car and really just delivered this weekend a well-deserved driver of the day performance from Lando Norris, in my opinion. And although Lando Norris, you know, when it came to the sprint race coming into the race qualifying, he didn't quite get all of the weekend together. I think just coming away with a second place finish, finishing in front of both of the Ferraris, finishing in front of a Red Bull is more than we can really ask for from Lando Norris as McLaren fans. And just, you know, setting himself up for a really nice ending. Obviously, the safety car did play into it a little bit. Would there, had there not been a safety car, had he not gone long on that first stint, maybe he would have been battling for Sergio Perez's position a little bit more. But once he got that opportunity, once he was into second place, it never looked in doubt and he was able to keep Sergio Perez at bay pretty well, in my opinion. Talking about Lando Norris's teammate, Oscar Piastri, Xavier here said, Piastri's weakness exposed. I know he had damaged and I love Oscar, but in that first stint, he was nowhere. And 
as you said, did pick up a little bit of damage to his diffuser, thanks to Daniel Ricardo and Lance Stroll coming together. But we'll get to that in a moment. That was a, a controversial one. Those definitely worth talking about. But I did feel like Piastri was missing just a little bit of something today. He does struggle when it comes to tracks uh, where tyre wear is a little bit uh, unpredictable. When the tyre wear is unpredictable and he's unsure of how those tyres are really going to hold up together, he's not, you know, showing the best of himself. And he has done really well so far this season. I don't want to put Oscar Piastri down. He's got a couple of fourth place finishes in there that have been very, very good. But this race this weekend just didn't go for him. And it seemed to just escape from him. And as Xavier said, still shows that he does have that weakness in his driving. He doesn't quite have the pace of the other drivers in the top four or five teams on these kind of tracks in these kind of conditions. And the other drivers around him are a lot more experienced. We have to also say that too. And he did finish ahead of the Mercedes. So like I, I, overall, he did okay, but not a great weekend for Oscar Piastri. And definitely when Lando Norris is shooting up and fighting the Red Bulls, Maybe just expect a little bit more from him. I know it's only his second season in Formula 1, but I do want Oscar Piastri to start taking a little bit of a step forward if he can. Then we move on to Max Verstappen. I do want to just talk about Max very, very quickly and then move on to some of the more controversial <laughs> talking points throughout the weekend. Um, Arna here says, Verstappen one day, Finna, just park his... Park his park, park his car in front of the podium and be like, just give it to me. We all know what's going to happen. And it was another imperious performance from Max Verstappen, really, wasn't it? It never seemed in doubt, especially after Australia, the issue that he had there, obviously the, the brake failure and therefore not being able to win that Grand Prix, losing another win streak to Carlos Sainz of all people. But Japan came back fighting and swung and then this weekend, it just looks even easier for Max Verstappen. Like, the added bonus of obviously getting the extra points come the sprint race. He, you know, had a little bit of a 50-50 when it came to sprint qualifying. The rain came down. It was a little bit of an equalizer for the rest of the grid. But then come the actual sprint itself, manages to get first place. Come a dry qualifying session on Saturday manages to get pole position and then just drove off and picked up the win and it just means that he still exists in this realm where Max Verstappen is so far ahead of the rest of the pack and what could have been done by Sergio Perez you know maybe he could have gone for a slightly different strategy maybe if Sergio Perez would have gone for the strategy that Lando Norris went for that could have worked out in his favor but I don't think Red Bull were really in the mindset of trying to get these two to battle it out in any way. Like they ended up double pitting. They had Verstappen come in and the Sergio Perez literally come in moments after him. And therefore, it just didn't really look like Sergio Perez was ever going to be able to put up any kind of fight. But that's not what they want anyway. Red Bull wants Sergio Perez to be just behind Max Verstappen. And the evidence is there that Max Verstappen still does have the better of this. I mean, he's always going to finish ahead of the rest of the field especially when Ferrari aren't having a great day Mercedes still not there Aston Martin still not there in my opinion but Sergio Perez is he going to be able to you know jump up to the level of Max Verstappen anytime soon not sure we all know that Red Bull is going to win the championship this season but could Ferrari fight for the championship next season I think that's definitely an option and that's what I mean Ferrari are kind of the closest competitors to Max Verstappen but I think for Ferrari, they still need to show that they can beat Sergio Perez first because it just feels like Sergio Perez is that barrier to success almost at this point. Max Verstappen is a league ahead in terms of his performance to Sergio Perez. So until the other teams, like Lando Norris today, for instance, until the other teams start being able to fight with at least Sergio Perez nobody is going to be able to get even close to Max Verstappen. That's the kind of point I'm trying to make. But yeah, Max Verstappen, just another insane drive from him. And the RB20, it was, it's just looking like it's working, right? We were all speculating before the season. Oh, they've made a lot of changes here. They've made a lot of changes there. Will they be able to turn last season performance into this season's performance? 
they've shown that like no matter what track it is no matter which drivers they're fighting against whether it's a ferrari whether it's a mclaren whether it's a mercedes they're still able to come out on top and with max verstappen just getting the most out of this red bull car time and time again he just it just doesn't look like there's ever going to be another driver win a Grand Prix, does there? If you're putting your money not on Max Verstappen to win a Grand Prix, you look like you're making the wrong decision at this point. Just so, so good from him. But yeah, I think Sergio Perez is now showing that he is good enough in that Red Bull car to maybe maintain his seat, but he's kind of the, the first boss that they need to get to. Sergio Perez is kind of like the henchman. You know in a video game where you got like the henchman and then you fight the final boss. You've got to start getting past the henchman. You've got to start getting past Sergio Perez before anyone is going to get anywhere close to Max Verstappen. And at the minute, Sergio Perez is performing and showing that that RB car is still way, way ahead of the rest of the pack. And on that, actually Alfie said here, Carlos should have come second instead of Lando, but Lando in third instead of second. I'm not sure I agree with that. I can understand what you mean. Carlos Sainz was definitely in the mix. So was Charles Leclerc at one point. Charles Leclerc, remember, went for the same strategy as Lando Norris, but just wasn't able to keep tabs with the McLaren car in the same way and therefore dropped behind Sergio Perez. So I'm not sure I agree with Carlos Sainz being on the podium. I could have maybe seen Charles Leclerc on the podium, and he had a little bit better pace, but wasn't quite the weekend the Scuderia were really after. They have looked the closest competitors for Red Bull this season, don't get me wrong. And I think Carlos Sainz, the fact that he's been on the podium for every single race other than this one, shows that the Ferrari is still the closest competitor. I mean, they're still there in the Constructors' Championship. But I think Ferrari this weekend will remember it more so for their two drivers just repeatedly smashing into one another and causing each other to just lose out on temps here and there not only through the sprint race but also through the grand prix itself both drivers just seem to be getting in the way and i mean carlos Sainz's qualifying crash nearly came back to bite him managed to still continue on the saturday was there got himself right in the mix but it was another like underwhelming performance and Again, we saw Carlos Sainz, Charles Leclerc side by side with each other at the beginning of the Grand Prix. And if anything, they just started to get in the way of each other. Like they just started to really cause each other a, a real headache. George Russell was able to get the jump on them at the start because they were causing themselves that issue. And therefore, Charles Leclerc's Grand Prix, instead of going the way of Lando Norris's, where the McLaren was able to jump Sergio Perez and get onto the podium... I feel like just that, the fact that Charles Leclerc had to then get past George Russell once again and lost that time behind the Mercedes, that might have just been that little thing that Sergio Perez might have then come out behind Charles Leclerc after the pit stops. And then Charles Leclerc is in a very different scenario. Because you've got to remember, Charles Leclerc only pit stopped once. Sergio Perez did that extra pit stop compared to those two. And that's where Lando Norris came out on top compared to the Ferraris. And... I mean, Sainz said himself, it just hasn't been a very good weekend for Ferrari as a team. It was the first time that Ferrari were put to this new kind of challenge. Like, we've seen lots of different tracks over the first five Grand Prix. They've looked very good in four of them. And then this one was the first one where it just looked like they came unstuck a little bit in terms of their performance this weekend. But I'd love to get your thoughts on Ferrari because it was a weird one. It was very up and down for Ferrari this weekend. Hamilton was also there. Yeah, Hamilton, you know, it's also... But obviously, when he's in a Ferrari next year, Hamilton, to me, looks like he just wants to be in a Ferrari now, if I'm honest. Um, he didn't really show too much this weekend. Haven't mentioned George Russell yet either. I think, again, had a, an okay race, did good enough. But the Mercedes car just isn't quite there. And that actually leads quite nicely on to Fernando Alonso. I mean, Polish Eddie said here, that the goat reflexes from Fernando Alonso, of course, talking about that very close to crash at the end of the Grand Prix, put on those medium compound tyres, was absolutely flying, but just dipped the rear end into the gravel. I did honestly think that was going to be it for Fernando Alonso. I thought he was going to do exactly what we saw Carlos Sainz do in qualifying and end up rotating that Aston Martin into the wall, but grabbed it. And he really made the most of a questionable strategy. The guy is aging backwards. And it does feel like Fernando Alonso 
is still getting better at this point. Like Fernando Alonso, the GOAT in the chat, definitely still at the absolute top level in terms of performance. I think it was a weird weekend for Fernando Alonso there. I think you can take lots of positives from those final 10 laps. But if you look at his weekend overall, you know, his exit from the sprint race was unfortunate consequences of like trying to get back ahead of Carlos Sainz, battling for third in that sprint race. Did he really need to do that? Are Aston Martin really fighting Ferrari right now? I don't think so. And therefore, I think Fernando Alonso kind of not should let Carlos Sainz pass or let Carlos Sainz have that position, but maybe should have been a little bit more wily and a little bit more sophisticated in that situation. And let's be honest, he, he, could, have, he could have got more points this weekend. Definitely could have got more points this weekend. And he does want to be fighting for victories. That's the thing, right? That's what Fernando Alonso is here for. He wants at least one more victory in his Formula 1 career. Otherwise, he was, wouldn't bothered, right? <laughs> He's absolutely one of the most competitive drivers on the Formula 1 grid. And at this age, could retire, go and live a wonderful life with all the money that he's got. But he wants to still be there. And you can see the passion and the drive that is in there for him. He wants to get every single point possible in his career. But I don't know. This weekend still, it was a decent point haul. There was a few that went begging. Obviously, Aston Martin's strategy around the safety car pit stops can be questioned a little bit. Obviously, they didn't know there was going to be a second safety car. So they chucked him onto the soft compound tyres. I think trying to make the most of that first safety car restart and maybe just catch some of the guys on the harder compound tyres sleeping a little bit, make up some positions there, which could have happened. And then we had a second safety car. So we don't really know what happened there. Uh, simply put... He did have another set of hard compound tires. Could he gone onto those? I don't, I don't know. It's very, very weird. And then his drive back through to seventh place was really entertaining. Like, if Fernando Alonso did nothing else this weekend, he put together the most entertaining kind of final 10 laps of the Grand Prix for us. Obviously finished ahead of Lewis Hamilton still, but wasn't quite able to catch George Russell in the end. And I think that's the thing for Mercedes and Aston Martin right now. You're looking at Fernando Alonso and you're a he threw away some points in the sprint, threw away some possible points in the race as well, even though he had a really good run at the end. If it would have gone slightly better for him, could he have just, just edged out Mercedes? And then Mercedes were looking at Aston Martin. And I personally think, like, Mercedes are there for the taking for Aston Martin in this season. I know they're fourth and fifth in the Constructors' Championship, and Mercedes have extended that lead a little bit this weekend. I genuinely feel like if Aston Martin got a little bit more out of Fernando Alonso this weekend, or more particularly got more out of their underachieving second car, Aston Martin could probably be ahead of Mercedes in this. And let's talk about Lance Stroll then, because Cool Car Fine says Lance Stroll needs to step up his game or be fired. And couldn't agree more, to be honest with you, but I think we've been saying this about Lance Stroll for maybe the last three, four seasons at this point. It does just continue on this rigmarole of Lance Stroll not quite being there. Like, don't get me wrong, his run against Kevin Magnussen right at the end of the Grand Prix was absolutely delicious to watch. I really enjoyed the battle between them, even if it was for last place of the drivers that were still on track. But it was another really patchy weekend for Lance Stroll. He just never quite seems to have 100%. Like, every weekend, there's always something that doesn't go quite right. And even the weekends where we're praising Lance Stroll, it's still praise with a little bit of ah, but he could have done this, or maybe he could have done that. And it doesn't quite roll in the way that he wanted it to. And although he had a good sprint race, he then turned to qualifying for the Grand Prix. Wasn't good enough. Like, exited in Q2 again when Fernando Alonso is dragging that car close to the front end of the grid. Like, Fernando Alonso at one point looked like he was going to be on the front row. And Lance Stroll is still dropping out in Q2. Okay, then you look at the incident that we've got in front of us and it's just clumsy. It's just another mistake where like Lance Stroll is so clumsy behind the wheel of that Aston Martin car and the onboard makes it pretty clear that he just wasn't really 
paying attention. Like, he just lost a little bit of concentration and he doesn't, he doesn't have a hundred percent, like, his mind in the moment. It's difficult to kind of explain. It's just, I, I, I think he is completely to blame. I know that some people are saying Daniel Ricciardo or, like, Fernando Alonso in front. There's a little bit of Fernando Alonso kind of locks up and that causes this kind of concertina effect. But you saw, for instance, Kevin Magnussen behind darted out of the way. Like he knew that if something was going to happen in front, he had the option and the ability and the reflexes to get out of the way. And I just don't know with Lance Stroll. It's so annoying. And uh it could have it could have been another points finish, but even then, even if it was another points finish without this incident, was it a good enough weekend? Probably not. But again, you have I know you can't compare directly to Fernando Alonso, but I think you can compare to George Russell, Lewis Hamilton, who are in a Mercedes car that I think is a little bit slower than this Aston Martin. You can compare to Oscar Piastri, who's only in his second season in Formula One. And Lance Stroll is just nowhere near any of that. Like, we're always talking about Lance Stroll battling with the Williamses, the Alpines, the Stakes, the Hasses, the, the RBs. And, and he shouldn't be there. He should be in that rung above. He should be with the cars in the category above that. But he's not. He's right in there with your Sonodas, your Ricardos, your Hulkenbergs a lot of the time. And that, for me, just isn't good enough from Lance Stroll at this point. And, yeah, definitely to blame for this incident. Can only really blame himself for throwing away some more points for Aston Martin. And I think Aston Martin can only really blame Lance Stroll for the fact that they're not closer to Mercedes or even above Mercedes in the Constructors' Championship right now, which I think they could be if this weekend would have gone better. And if, well, just the last few weekends would have gone better, really. I think Lance Stroll this season hasn't been great and then we kind of have the repercussions of that in that Daniel Ricciardo it was looking like a better weekend Josh says even when Daniel Ricciardo has his best weekend of the season he's still DNS through no fault of his own he can't seem to find any luck at the minute and I don't think it would have been points for Daniel Ricciardo I've heard a few people going oh Daniel Ricciardo probably would have picked up points this weekend in the RB not sure it would have been points for him. I think he would have been close. Maybe that best of the rest, kind of 11th place finish. The battle with Nico Hulkenberg would have been very interesting. Obviously, in the end, he probably wouldn't have finished 10th because of a penalty he picked up. But we'll get to that in a moment. It, it was looking like a really good weekend for Daniel Ricciardo. Let's go for the positives. Because even though he had that calamitous collision with Lance Stroll, it felt like... Lance Stroll ruined his race, right? It could have easily been like, oh, Danny Ricciardo was falling down the grid anyway, and it didn't really matter too much. Okay, he DNF'd and Lance Stroll took him out, but he was never going to finish anywhere. It did feel like, oh no, Lance Stroll has come in and, and actually ruined a driver's race here that was driving very well and could have gone on to maybe pick up some points um, or at least been in that battle in contention for points. And RB, they didn't quite have the pace, to be in the points like with Yuki Tsunoda this weekend and that's maybe a little bit of a sign that the upgrade that came to Daniel Ricciardo's car was very very good or maybe that Yuki Tsunoda was having a bit of an off weekend because Yuki Tsunoda for me has been one of the best drivers on the Formula 1 grid this season and he just seemed a little bit out of it and Daniel Ricciardo really stepped up to the plate but I don't know it, it was Daniel Ricciardo staying out there on the restart remember he was on the worn medium tyres so Again, he probably would have dropped a couple of positions to the chasers behind. And maybe it would have... I don't know. It is so tough to say where Daniel Ricciardo would have ended up. Because he could have pit stopped and then done a little bit of a Fernando Alonso at the end. And maybe just gone for a little bit of a rush through the pack. And depending on how far the pack had spread by that point. Because there were a lot of DRS trains towards the back end of the field. It felt like those five cars towards the back end of the pack were very, very close this weekend. The Alpine stepped up. RB stepped up. It was it was very, very close. And all that for not a lot at the end of the day because the takeaway from this is that his teammate Yuki Tsunoda, even with an off weekend, is still miles ahead of him in the standings. And even if there's nothing to show in terms of the results, in terms of the championship... I think we can take a massive 
positive for Daniel Ricciardo from this weekend. Daniel had a bod strategy, but he was driving good enough this weekend. Exactly, exactly. I think the strategy is difficult to know where he would have really ended up in all of this, to be honest. But I do think he had a much, much better weekend. Uh, and therefore, we can take a lot of positives for Daniel Ricciardo. For the first time in what feels like a long time for Daniel Ricciardo, we can take a lot of positives. And yeah, Lance Stroll kind of ruined any chance of us really knowing what the pace of Daniel Ricciardo was going to be like towards the end of the Grand Prix. Although, just to add salt to the wound, if Daniel Ricciardo had been able to, you know, put on a fresh set of tyres and done a little bit of an Alonso at the end and stormed through the pack, just to add a little bit of salt, Daniel Ricciardo has been given a three-place grid penalty because he was given a 10-second time penalty, which he didn't manage to actually um, uh, get rid of during the race, didn't manage to... Uh, have during the race because he didn't manage to pit because being taken out by Lance Stroll and therefore for the upcoming Miami Grand Prix weekend he's got a three place grid penalty although it is a sprint weekend so that three place grid penalty will come in the sprint for Daniel Ricciardo uh, and he picked that up for overtaking Nico Hülkenberg under safety car conditions and I think basically Daniel Ricciardo got a little bit confused because Hulkenberg jumped in front of Daniel Ricciardo in the pit stops, I want to say, uh, just before the safety car came out. And then Daniel Ricciardo kind of took that place back under the safety car. It was a little bit of a strange incident, but Daniel Ricciardo, three-place penalty, a ruined weekend, and a three-place penalty. Not one to remember, unfortunately. <laughs> My weekend, Fernando Alonso was a magic. He was, but as I said, I think there was a little bit more possible to come from him uh, i did just want to mention nico hulkenberg again not one that many people most of the hot takes this weekend were about daniel ricardo and lance stroll not gonna lie to you or for and fernando alonso's kind of run at the end of the grand prix but i did want to mention nico hulkenberg because for me nico hulkenberg is now clearly the best of the back half like in terms of those drivers down there the hasses the rbs the stakes like, he is just absolutely flying this weekend, uh, this weekend and this season. I think he was in the mix for this award last year. I think Alex Albon probably edged it. I think a lot of people, you know, looked at Albon's 2023 season. Like, yeah, he was probably the best of that kind of back-of-the-pack drivers. But for me, Nico Hülkenberg absolutely smashing it this season and making that award of kind of best of the rest or best of the back half or best of the worst teams effectively i think he's absolutely smashing it is nico holkenberg and just wanted to give it to him because you know one point okay he's definitely had better weekends in his career but right now nico holkenberg and Haas in that formula one midfield like the opportunities for points are going to be very few and far between but they are making that opportunity their own you know again you're looking at lance stroll the only driver from those top five teams that was outside of the points again this weekend even with lewis hamilton starting in 18th he was still able to finish in ninth that's the gap between the top five teams and the bottom five teams and the fact that you know, it's still 10th place is that only slot that opened up. But once again, it's Nico Hülkenberg. And what's that three out of five Grand Prix now that Nico Hülkenberg has slotted himself in there? I know Yuki Tsunoda is higher in the standings. But I think in terms of consistency, Nico Hülkenberg for me has just been sublime throughout this. And I think it's more the fact that the Haas team were expected to be absolutely nowhere. When it came to the beginning of this season, I think everybody had Haas in 10th place in their predictions because it just looked like it was going to go so wrong so quickly. And instead, he scored points in three of the first five Grand Prix. And he only managed to score that. I, I think he only managed three points finishes throughout the entirety of the 2023 season. And he's already done that in five races. Just sublime, in my opinion. I know they might be disappointed that they didn't do very well in the sprint. There wasn't really any opportunity to score points in the sprint for those teams towards the back of the pack. So I think Nico Hülkenberg won't lose too much sleep over that, to be honest with you. And Hülkenberg coming out into the Grand Prix itself, the race where it really matters, he was once again that guy and just did it every single lap. 
Also wanted to mention Sauber. No one mentioned Sauber in the hot take, so I thought I'd throw one in as well. I just thought it was great to see Joe finally achieve his dream of racing at his home Grand Prix. He was so close to points in the sprint, which I do think is a massive positive for this stake Sauber team moving forward. But Sauber still struggle with the full race pace and they still struggle with pit stops. It is so frustrating that they can't get a pit stop right down at Sauber. But that is where we are this weekend. It was another race weekend where Sauber just looked like they were on the periphery. Like they were in that like marginal points contention area. Kind of 12th to 14th I felt like was the best possible finish for either of the Sauber drivers and perhaps with an even better weekend, perhaps if something had gone slightly differently, perhaps if they'd gone for a different strategy, they would have been able to get there. But Joe, I think, managed a very solid sprint race performance. And I think from the weekend as a whole, that'll be the thing that he holds on to. The fact that he finished best of the rest, finished ninth in that sprint race. Okay, I think the fact that there's no pit stops in the sprint race definitely helped him. But just that fact that he can do that, hold that up and, and be there, so incredible for him. And then Valtteri Bottas, come the actual race itself, was probably the more likely stake Sauber driver to actually end up, again, in that periphery of points, maybe jumping up into 10th place had something gone wrong for Nika Hulkenberg. But again, they just didn't quite capitalize on others' misfortune. It never seems to be them. You know what I mean? Like, when Daniel Ricciardo gets smashed into, it never seems like they take benefit from that because Valtteri Bottas has already retired from the Grand Prix because his engine blew up and it just doesn't quite ever seem to like whenever they roll the dice they never fall in Sauber's favor and I think they'll eventually get a little bit of luck roll their way at some point in the season and it will go a little bit better for them but at least you know they got the pit stops a little bit better this time you know it, it's still not the best pit stops you're ever going to see in your life but it's definitely getting better and better and better and now that they've dropped to last in the constructor standings, I think, because Ocon finished in 11th place and Albon has finished in 11th place as well, whereas I don't think either of the Sauber drivers has finished in 11th. Am I right in that? So it'll be interesting to see. Obviously, it, it, it none of those teams have got any points yet, so there's not too much to really go off of there. And I guess it's a bit of a silver lining that instead of dropping behind the cars at the end... Joe Guang Yu was able to move forwards at the end of the Grand Prix. Again, showing like they, they do have pace and they can hold on to their tyres and maybe they can go a little bit better. But I, I think we can take a lot of positives for this team. P11 maximum. Yeah, that's what I mean. They were right on that periphery, weren't they? It was like, I felt like Valtteri Bottas was going to be in the mix with Nico Hulkenberg towards the end, but just didn't happen. Magnussen did help Hulkenberg and Jella. That's very true. That's very, very true. But still, Hulkenberg is, is going out there and delivering it. I thought this was an interesting one from Boneless Watermelon. I'd love to get your thoughts on it because I did think it was quite a weird weekend for this kind of thing. So, Boneless Watermelon said, How TF did Logan Sargent get the same penalty as Stroll? One made a mistake on observing safety car protocols. So if you didn't see this, uh, Lance, Lance Stroll, uh, Logan Sargent picked up a 10 second penalty for overtaking uh, Nico Hulkenberg during the safety car because Nico Hulkenberg had crossed the pit exit line before Logan Sargent had. And it was like 10, 15 centimeters. It was very, very weird that. I. I it was very, very weird that Sargent picked up that penalty. Like, I know it's letter of the law stuff. But I think somebody on the radio should have probably known and that should have been able to be like swapped around fairly quickly. It felt weird that Sargent ended up with that penalty. But I think the more contentious penalty this weekend and the one I really want to get your thoughts on is the fact that Fernando Alonso picked up a three penalty points on his uh, super license for his overtake on Carlos Sainz where to be fair, they did come together and it was a little bit dangerous but like at the end of the day, nothing really came of it, apart from Fernando Alonso losing out on point uh, on points during the sprint race. He picked up three penalty points for that. Lance Stroll picked up two penalty points for literally rear-ending somebody behind the safety car and completely ending their Grand Prix. I, I don't know how 
Logan Sargent ends up with a 10 second penalty for the tiniest of infringements. And Lance Stroll gets the same penalty for smashing into the back of Daniel Ricciardo. They were both 10 second penalties. And then if you compare the penalty points that have been added to their super licenses, Fernando Alonso got three for trying to overtake Carlos Sainz. And Lance Stroll again got two for smashing into somebody and ruining their race. I I'm, I'm just don't know how, how the FIA and how the stewards are kind of making all of this make sense. And there's a lot of hand moments here, movements. Just I just don't know how those those align with one another. And Fernando Alonso does seem to be kind of getting in a little bit of trouble with the FIA on a repeat basis at this point. Obviously, there was the incident in uh, in Australia with George Russell. He got into a little bit of trouble there. He then sort of spoke out against that in Japan. And now he's again getting in a little bit of trouble here in China. I think the FIA and Fernando Alonso clearly don't see eye to eye on a lot of issues. And I'm not sure how that is maybe not playing in his favour, let's say, <laughs> with Fernando Alonso at this point. Finally, I did want to talk about the overall race. Uh, did Ricardo get a penalty? Ricardo did get a penalty as well, but that was for overtaking under the safety car, which is a stone wall penalty. A little bit like Logan Sargent's one. It's just one of the ones that's in the books and you can't do. So Danny Ricardo ended up with a 10 second penalty for that, which turns into a three place grid penalty. So again, another Danny Ricardo only got 10 second penalty for overtaking under the safety car, whereas Lance Stroll got a 10 second penalty for smashing into the back of Danny Ricardo. So it's like, okay. Lance Stroll's penalty definitely should have been worse, in my opinion. Yeah, Tyson saying the same thing. I, I just feel like that was a weird, contentious one. And then uh, Priceless Smile rounding us out. I don't know why teams don't take risks getting rookies in the car when it's clear there are a couple of drivers who still race like rookies. I think, again, just kind of throwing a little bit of shade towards Lance Stroll, although there's also... I would say Logan Sargent hasn't been very good this season. Lance Stroll hasn't been very good. Kevin Magnussen has been very 50-50 throughout the campaign this year. You know, you could even throw a few of the other drivers in there that it does feel like there is a big driver market move coming in 2025. Obviously, Lewis Hamilton has started the domino effect. We know that Fernando Alonso is staying at Aston Martin. But it does feel like, you know, Antonelli, Beerman, Lawson, maybe even Martins or Doohan, maybe Porsche could even find his way onto the Formula One grid. It does feel like the Formula One grid in general just needs a little bit of a freshen up. And I agree, the Chinese Grand Prix, there was a lot of drivers that just felt like they were driving for the sake of it. And like it didn't, didn't feel like they really cared too much. And it just felt a little bit drab at times. And I do think Formula One just needs an injection of some fresh blood. You know, I think back to like 2019 or 2018 when Leclerc was coming through, Russell, Norris, Albon, and there were so many talking points about those young drivers. Since then, the rookies that have come through just haven't really caught the eye. Oscar Piastri aside, Joe Guan Yu, I know it was lovely to see that it's his home Grand Prix, but is he good enough to be on the Formula One grid for, you know, years to come? Probably not. And I think there's just a few drivers that are coming towards the end of their career. It could definitely be swapped out. And yeah, I'd definitely love to see maybe three, four, even five rookies added to the grid next season. And I don't think like that's impossible. I think that could definitely happen. Although Lawson doesn't technically count as a rookie anymore. I'm kind of throwing him in there. I do think Lawson, Antonelli, Behrman are the three that could definitely happen. I think if Alpine really wanted to, they could throw a Martins or a Dewan in. Like Ocon, Gasly, neither of them are really standing out at this point. And they're good enough, but are they going to do anything special? Probably not. Teo Porsche is the other one at Sauber. Will Audi go in that direction? I, I don't think so. But again, French, maybe he goes into Alpine if one of the Alpine drivers steps aside. I think there's definitely an opportunity for a lot of young talent to be injected into the Formula 1 grid. And I would really, really love to see it. Let's round out with the Drivers' Championship then. Max Verstappen still leads it on 110 points. You can see a clear hierarchy sort of developing. It is Red Bull from Ferrari, from McLaren, then a little mix of Mercedes and Aston Martin. I genuinely feel like if Lance Stroll was just a little bit better, that could be a proper, 
battle between those guys in the championship. Yuki Tsunoda in there in, set, uh, in 11th place with seven points. Oli Behrman, still that kind of barrier for the back of the pack field. Nico Hulkenberg edges ever closer to Oli Behrman. He's got four points now. Kevin Magnussen, the only other driver to get a point towards the back end of the field. Albon, Ocon, Joe, Ricardo, Gasly, Bottas, Sargent in that order with zero points on the board. Red Bull, Ferrari, McLaren, as I said, in the Constructors' Championship. Mercedes and Aston Martin, 12 points now, the gap between those two. RB in sixth place with seven points. Haas now have five points. They close that gap to just two points between RB and Haas. I think that's going to be a real battle for sixth place as the season develops. Williams, Stake, and Alpine at the back of the pack. Hadjar as well. Yeah, really good one. Hadjar's a little bit interesting, though, because obviously if Lawson goes in... Then Hajar, where does he go? <laughs> like, Hajar, though. Is Hajar French? I want to say he's French. Maybe he goes to Alpine. Never know. But there we are. That is the Chinese Grand Prix done and dusted. Round five of the Formula One season. We are already a quarter of the way through. And no, a fifth of the way through. <laughs> it's 24 races. So a fifth of the way through the season. And... It just feels like Max Verstappen running away with it still. McLaren looking to join the battle with Ferrari, though. Can Lando Norris be that man to jump up in the standings, catch the back of the Ferraris? Maybe, just maybe. Fernando Alonso once again in trouble. Lance Stroll causing chaos. Daniel Ricciardo looking better. It was really great. I thought the Chinese Grand Prix was a lot of fun. The safety cars definitely added a very sophisticated, weird dynamic to the pit stops where everybody didn't quite know what to do. But thank you guys so, so much for watching this weekend. We will be live once again for the Miami Grand Prix weekend, which is once again a sprint race. So we'll be live for sprint qualifying, the sprint race itself, qualifying and the Grand Prix. So four lives over the course of that weekend, plus the hot takes live as well. So five lives coming up in two weekends time in miami all five lives are also available this weekend on the channel as well also put together a video on williams just before the chinese grand prix so if you check that out that's in the description down below but thank you so so much for watching leave a like subscribe